Hi, I'm Tim Magna from Team Merging Technologies, and today we're going to talk about MSIX packaging fundamentals, and in particular focus with folks that are coming from an AppV world, but we'll also be having a lot of great information for folks that are not coming from that space as well. So when it comes to MSIX, there's a lot of different stories that are out there that we could be talking about. And so there is a whole developer story associated with MSIX. And uh, there's an IT pro story as well. And on the developer side, you know, Microsoft has actually been making some good progress here, I believe, in this last year, even though we're not necessarily seeing a lot of independent software vendors coming out with packages in MSIX format yet. They're now starting to get interest due to what Microsoft has been doing behind the scenes for the developers to make this worth their while. And so uh, the short end of the story on this is that, you know, in the past, developers were kind of stuck in these silos. They could build their applications for Win32, or they could build their applications for the .NET framework, or they could build their applications as UWP. And what Project Reunion is about, which is finally starting to come to fruition for the developers, is an environment in which they can kind of mix and match the components or breaking them out of their silos and they can take advantage of the best pieces of everything going forward. But to do that, they're going to have to run these things inside an MSIX container. And so while Microsoft continues to evolve the tooling and the capabilities for the vendors along with the operating system itself, if they want to take advantage of all of these new things going forward, they really need to get themselves into this kind of environment. So they've got some time to do that. And I think as we take a look at the transition that these organizations went through, uh, you know, I remember being on the Microsoft campus in 2001 when .NET was initially announced. And it wasn't until about 2005, 2006, that we really started to see vendors come out with .NET framework-based applications, you know, in mass. And we expect to see that same type of slowness here with MSIX. They're not going to change everything over on day one. We'll probably see a lot of them not even change their existing applications in the MSIX, but as they come out with new products, they'll base it around this form. So, you know, as I uh, like to say, MSIX is going to be a walk and not a marathon. And so over time, we'll start seeing more and more of that out there. You know, we do see a few small applications that are out there. Quite frankly, there's a bunch of stuff in the game space that I don't pay attention to. But we've seen a couple of enterprise apps that have an MSIX option today, and we'll see more going forward. Now, on the IT Pro side, the stories there have really been gathering all of the headlines. IT Pros have been ex very excited about MSIX. And as they've gotten into it, they've probably also been a little bit disappointed because they felt that it would be better than it is. And again, MSIX is a work in progress. Um, I'll show you some information about how we're moving along in that progress. But what I try to encourage every IT organization to do is to start that journey. You know, get out in your neighborhood and start walking around and getting to know MSIX. Work with the applications that work well with MSIX today because there's all sorts of operational aspects that you're going to need to learn as part of this journey. You're going to need to learn about code signing certificates. You're going to need to learn about how you deploy these applications a little bit differently. And most important, your organization is going to have to learn how to support end users as they have these MSIX applications because they are coming. So it makes sense to start to gather some of that experience now while it's easy and not while you're under the gun with some great new application that you can't figure out how to get to work. Now there is a third story, and it tends to be buried in the newspapers, quite frankly. Um, there's a security story associated with MSIX as well. And I don't want to overplay the security story because MSIX is not a security solution. I want to make that very clear. It's not a security solution, but it is part of the mix for security. And the whole concept that we originally, you know, really had just a monolithic operating system and then we broke out so we got the kernel and the, op and the application separated from each other. And then we separated out users from each other and you get your own independent user session where you not only get the separation from a security standpoint, but you also get the ability to personalize the Windows experience by having those uh, different sessions running and, and even simultaneously on the same operating system. 
And then, of course, we had things like UAC come into play, where we sort of separate out things that need extra privileges from the standard run-of-the-mill stuff. And what MSIX is doing is taking these applications a step further and running them in a container, which inherently is a little bit more secure. Again, not the security solution, but it's a little bit more secure than if it was running raw native on the system. We're really trying to make sure that when you install and you run this application, that it cannot harm the rest of the operating system and the rest of the applications on there. And if something bad does happen, therefore the issue is a little bit more contained than it is otherwise. So again, not a solution, but it is part of the story. And it's part of the story that as we get more and more apps running in this type of mode, is going to make our systems overall far more secure. So how do we start this journey? How do we start this walk? Well, one of the places that I want to point you to is a community website of mine called m6conf.com. So this is a, a community site which is geared towards MSIX. And in addition to myself, you'll find there are a number of the, the vendors in the space that also participate on this site and provide information about MSIX. But clearly the highlight of this site is the MSIX report card, which is a project that I take on each year. And in January, I released this report card that sort of reviews the state of where we are with MSIX today. And a key part of that is some application compatibility testing that I do each year. And the chart that I'm showing you here is sort of a summary of the results over the last three years of releasing these report cards. So, you know, back with the 1809 version of the operating system, I did this first round of testing, and we were seeing only about 20% compatibility for applications. So this is taking a look at a large set of enterprise-style applications and running them through the same type of criteria that an enterprise IT team would take in repackaging this application and deploying it out. So all of the full flavor of the UAT style testing that they are likely to do. And so that, that green area you see on the screen there sort of represents the result of that UAT test with a very fine line criteria. So I like to call this the full fidelity model. So where you would take the application and you compare it against the MSI or EXE install or maybe AppV install that you have today and does the end user see 100% of the full fidelity of that application, or is there something missing? So that's a very tight criteria, but it's the criteria that a lot of enterprises would be using in this type of mode, certainly early on with MSIX, because you don't want to impose MSIX on the end users and take things away from them. Now, over time, that number has grown, and as we take a look at the testing from this year, uh, the base level of the operating system itself, as you move into 2004, although my testing was on 20H2, the results should have been about the same with the 2004 OS, but there's improvements to the base operating system itself that take that number from the 20% we originally had up to just a little over 30% in this year's testing. But in addition to that, we now also have available the package support framework. So the package support framework is sort of an add-on piece to MSIX to help with compatibility with these older applications. So Microsoft originally created the package support framework as an open source project up on GitHub. And while it was technically there that first year, it was really only available in source code form. And so I couldn't imagine any IT pro taking and downloading and breaking out Visual Studio to build their own package support framework. So we didn't even include it in that first year's testing. But since then, I've produced some tooling. Uh, PSF tooling is an app that we'll take a look at here as a free community tool that uh, makes that binary version available to you and helps you implement it in your packaging efforts. I've also spent a lot of time, particularly this last year, adding to the package support framework to improve the overall capability of the PSF. And so now as we bring the PSF into place here in this last round of testing, we got just shy of the 60% mark for application compatibility in that full fidelity model. Now the gray and yellow parts that you see on this chart are an area which is a little more subjective. Right? There are some applications that we package, we test, we go through UAT test, and the functionality of the app is mostly there but there may be some little things that are missing. You know, this could be a shell extension. And for some companies, they're just not going to deploy the application without that shell extension because the end users 
really rely on that with the way that they use the application. Whereas with other organizations, they may not care at all about the shell extension. Excuse me. And they may not care at all. And so um, they're going to consider that app acceptable. And so the yellow and the gray there are situations where the application is missing a little bit of that full fidelity, but some organizations are going to look at that on a per app basis and decide that, no, that app is good enough for the way that we use it. And so with those numbers in this year's testing, we get to nearly 75%. So we're about 73% um, in the uh, the most flexible of those scenarios. As you, as you get into the red area, those are apps that just are outright unacceptable today. And that's an area that we're going to have to continue to work on going forward. So how do we get started on this journey? Well, I'm going to start for those customers that are using Microsoft AppV today because there's a piece of the story that's special for them. And they're probably a little better off in moving towards MSIX than a lot of the other customers because they've already been running these applications inside of containers. So I'm gonna do a little demo here. I'm gonna be using the Microsoft packaging tool. Those of you who come from the AppV world will think of this as the new version of the sequencer. And I'll be using some scripting that will allow us to use that tool to convert our AppV packages into MSIX in an automated fashion. So we're gonna start out here and here I'm on a virtual machine. It's the same virtual machine that I would use for my AppV packaging. Um, I also have the Microsoft packaging tool installed here. And um, we're going to use that to do the conversion. So I'm going to start by showing you the GUI method. This is the place to start. Just do a single package and start doing a little bit of testing to learn the ropes here. So you start up the Microsoft MSIX packaging tool. You get to this dialog and just browse out and find one of your .appv files. So here I've got one here. It's an app called Avrigato. I can just open it up. If I just click through next, it will do a conversion of that application. Now, this is not an application recapture operation. This is just doing a format conversion from the AppV format, which is basically a zip format with a MS, uh, an AppV uh, manifest file inside it. And we're going to be converting it into a different zip-based file with a different format for the manifest. Now, rather than do this individually on apps, I mean, you might do that for the first one, but then you're really going to want to script this work. So I found this uh, blog post by, from one of the Microsoft people that talked about doing some PowerShell to do the conversion using a command line interface of the tool. So I've updated that script to sort of automate that whole process because he still was looking at doing an individual app. And so I've got a script up on my blog that you can download there, and the links are in the slides for this uh, deck. Um, and, that, and that script would allow you to come in and just modify the top few lines that are in here. So you'd, you'd specify where your AppV packages can get found, so give it a folder for that, and then where you want to put the MSIX packages, and then you have to put in the information for your code signing certificate. Now, I don't have time to talk about code signing certs here today. That's something you're gonna have to learn, but once you do it once, then it's just plugging that in. It's not a terribly big deal. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run this script. Now this script uses another uh, uh, free tool of mine called Passive Install. So I use this for all of my PowerShell automation scripting. It's just another PowerShell uh, uh, framework that just makes the job of writing scripts like this easier. It automates some of the simple things uh, that you want to do that become a little more complicated in PowerShell. So I'm running this against a share here where I've got just two AppV packages, make it nice and simple. And it's gonna loop through and do both of those because it, it's not during the machine. This is just a straight out conversion. So the first of the two packages, it looks like it's uh, finished up now. Uh, that's called Avrigato. Um, Avrigato is a, uh, not too large of an application. I think it's about 70 megabytes in size. Um, but it's a, a very graphically rich application. This is an app that would be used by someone who is maybe a molecular biologist. And so it allows them to uh, build and view models, uh, 3D models of, uh, of comp chemical compounds and interact with them. Uh, the second application that is working on now is Siemens JT, uh, JT to go. Uh, so this is an application that takes uh, Jupyter tessellation models 
and allows uh, for a 3D modeling rendering of that. And so this is something that someone maybe might use uh, out at a construction site where you know someone has built the entire thing that they're supposed to be building and they just wanna be able to quickly bring up the drawings and interact with it and take measurements to be sure that they're, they're building the building properly. So I ran this against a, a large number of my AppV packages. Um, I found it, it generally takes about two minutes on average to complete one of these uh, conversions. So uh, I think I did 75 apps in about two hours. So, you know, if you had uh, just a single VM like this, you set up, you ran this script against your share and you had maybe a thousand packages, uh, that might mean it takes about a day to run through and do all of those conversions. But, you know, you don't have to interact with it. You just start it up, go do the rest of your stuff, come back tomorrow and check out the log files when you're done. Okay, so I see it completed both of the packages. Um, it's now going back and applying the code signing certificate against those, so that those packages could be ready for test if we wanted to. But before we do the test, we're really gonna take a look at that log file. So uh, during the conversion, the conversion tool will point out issues that it can notice that says that eh, you probably don't wanna use this method for this package. And so if you are a company that did a lot of AppV scripts in your packages, um, you're going to see every one of those packages with scripts get flagged in that log file because those are things that you're just going to have to handle by hand. Um, no matter what happens, even though technically there would, might be a way to be able to get the scripting directly copied over, uh, chances are someone needs to put eyeballs on that script, take a look at what it was doing. Does it still make sense to do that? Are the server shares and things like that that are probably being mentioned the same ones that will be in the new environment? So we would want to touch, the, touch those things. Okay, so it finished the job. Uh, I was just showing the code certificate that was on there. But here's the log file. I'll show you what you're looking for. Now, there's always going to be this line that says ignoring default server port. Um, that's just a warning that says, that, hey, you were running it on the same machine. I wasn't remoting that work. But I'm really interested in that creating MSIX package line and the line underneath it that I've highlighted here um, where it completed the job. And so for this first package, Avogadro, it completed very cleanly. Whereas on the second package, we'll see here that there is this COM warning that showed up there. And so that's something that it saw as part of the process that the packaging tool here didn't handle properly. And so it's telling you right now, your package probably isn't any good. And so uh, what I do is I go through this log file and I'll just accept the packages that have no warnings to move on to the next step and then start going through the UAT style testing against those packages. And the other ones we're gonna want to do a slightly different way. So before I talk about uh, uh, the effects on that filtering, I, I wanna pull out some more information from this year's uh, packaging report card to, to make a point here. So on the left, we're seeing the test results of a full application recapture of applications using the Microsoft packaging tool without using the package support framework. Because when we do the conversion that we just did, we're really doing something very, very similar. There's no concept of bringing in the package support framework in that conversion. It's just not one of the things that's supported in there. But the conversion software is also probably a little bit behind the software that was used to do this testing when we go through the full recapture. So it's a slightly different path within the tool and Microsoft hasn't kept it quite as much up to date as the testing we see here. So we get slightly different kind of results. But you know, where we have the applications that don't work in the converter, we're able to come over do the recapture, which does bring in the ability to bring in the packet support framework and improve the odds of having a good application. So if I take a look at a company that has maybe a thousand applications, like I said earlier, you run them through the converter. So that's just setting up the VM, letting it run for a day. You come back, you're probably gonna find about a third of your packages pass through that log filter test. So those are the ones that, that look like they were clean at that point. That doesn't mean that they're gonna be good applications because you know we still have problems with some of these applications. Now, fortunately, a lot of the problems that caused the log filter to get uh, an indication are problems that would have shown up in here. So we get a little better result. And what I find is that as I go through the UAT test for that 
one third of the applications that pass the log filter, about half of those will actually be good applications without the package support framework. So if we start out with a thousand applications, uh, we spend a day running this script. We then go through UAT tests for the 300 some packages. Um, that's probably about a week's worth of work. We'll come out with 160 packages, which are really good packages. And, and you know, we talk about you know, taking a journey and walking and starting with the apps that work well. Those are the packages that work well, and you'll be there with a very minimal amount of work. So that's a great place to get started with MSIX. But what about the packages that don't work out of the box? Or maybe you're not coming from AppV. And so for those, we want to use a combination of tools. So we're going to use the Microsoft packaging tool in this next demo to recapture that Siemens application. So I'm going back to the original installer. Now, of course, if your shop has been very good about following the best practices in application packaging in the past, you probably have some good information about how that application gets installed and configured today. And if you do, it makes this part of the job so much easier. If not, I want to heavily encourage you to make that part of the job as you repackage into MSIX and make sure you start recording that type of documentation so that it is available because no matter what happens, you're never in the last migration your company's ever going to do. There's always going to be something new coming down the road in the future. And so you want to have that type of information available to make the job easier then. The second tool we're going to use is my PSF tooling tool, which we use to inject and bring in the package support framework so that we can get the benefits of the PSF in that packaging and get better application compatibility. So I'm going back to my packaging machine here and I've got both of these two tools installed and I've got my installer set up here ready to go where we install the application, we configure it, we do things like disable the uh, auto updates that we always want to uh, get rid of in most cases. And I'm going to start up the packaging tool here. I'm going to go here to the configuration to start with. Just to show you, this is where you put in your code signing certificate. So when you have that in place, put in the password for that and any other configuration you might want to do. And this is where we're going to start the application capture wizard. So I'm going to do it on the machine that I'm logged in on. I really don't do this tool remotely, but that is a possibility. And one of the first things the tool wants to do is install a capture filter driver into the operating system. But it's also going to be taking a look at the other things that are running. And so if it finds things like Windows Update or maybe you accidentally left a configman client running on this machine, it will detect those things and disable them for you. Because those are pieces of software that will make additional noise in the background that will end up capturing the package. We don't want that to happen, so we make sure we put those things off. So here I'm going to go ahead and put in the package name. And uh, oh yeah. Right There's my underscore problem. So those of you who are used to AFI packaging know we use underscores all the time in the package names. We'll have to learn in MSIX we can't do that. Uh, we'll use the dash character instead. But also all of those GUIDs that we had in AppV are now gone, by the way. Um, everything is done through the package name and the package version fields to create that idea of the unique identity and the whole upgrade downgrade process being integrated into MSIX. All right, so I got my version information in here and I'm ready to go and capture. So I always do all my captures in what the AppV folks would know as a VFS style. I don't specify the install directory um, in there. I just go ahead and install. So I've got my customized script up here. You can see it's going to do some uh, got a reg file it's going to import. It's got some other files it wants to copy around in addition to the main install itself. And I'll go ahead and run that. So just keep in mind that the process we're using here, we're using the Microsoft MSIX packaging tool. And what it is doing is it's going to do a capture of all of the file and registry changes. And it's going to save those off in this uh, virtualized world. Now, while this tool is running, after I've installed and configured the application, that's where I'm going to bring in the package support framework. So I happen to know that this is an app that requires some PSF components. But as I'm doing this packaging process, I actually always want to run PSF tooling. Now I'll run it while I'm still in the monitoring mode here, because the idea is that we're going to run this tool 
and we're going to make changes and the cap and the packaging tool is going to capture the changes that this tool makes in addition to the install from the app. So as you start up PSF tooling, again, it's a free community tool up in the Microsoft Store. Um, you click on this Suggest Fix-Ups, and here it's telling us that it, quite obviously this is an app that's going to require the file redirection fix-up of the PSF. Um, it's got some INI and XML files here that are part of the package in the program file area, and the only way the app is going to be able to modify those files is if we bring in the package support framework so that we get this right access. So having seen that, I'll just ask for that type of fix up and I would bring in any other fix ups that are necessary here. Uh, by default, I always bring in the inject dynamic library fix up if I do any of the fix ups, just because it helps, helps take care of DLL not found issues that happen in packages. Now there are some types of issues such as the, uh, the registry fix ups and that we can't detect through what the application has installed here. Um, someone actually has to detect that at runtime, so that would be part of the UAT test, and if you found you needed that type of fix up, you'd come back and repackage. Uh, but for this app, this is all we're really gonna need, um, so we'll now ask the app uh, to go and search for the various components out there and show us what types of changes it would probably wanna make. So one of the things we'll do is we'll be dropping down a launcher program and changing the shortcut. So rather than point to the main executable, we're going to point to this new PSF launcher, and the PSF launcher is going to in implement all of the package support framework fix-ups for us. So this is just a nice visualization of how that ends up working. It actually kind of goes back, for those of you who are in AppV, back to the old AppV 4.6 days, where we used to have the shortcuts pointing to SFT tray. All right, so these are some of the other things that it found that it's also going to fix up. There are some EXEs behind the scene that might also need the fix ups. And I'll hit the apply button here, which will show me the detailed changes that are going to get made. And I'll get an opportunity to do some additional um, customization should I need to. Although in most cases, the tool is doing exactly what we need. But you can see we're going to drop a lot of different components in place. We're going to update that shortcut that we saw. Uh, it's going to have to extract the icon from our original shortcut and inject that into our launcher program so that uh, it looks correct in the start menu. And then this is showing you the JSON-based configuration file that the package support framework uses. So this is really providing all of the instructions for that launcher for what it's supposed to do. So it'll include uh, the ability to specify the application, any command line arguments that we might need, um, as well as all the fix-ups. And then, of course, if we wanted to do any package scripting, that's also done by having the launcher run those scripts for us. So anytime we want to do package scripting, we would bring in the launcher, even if we didn't need the rest of the components, just so that we could do that scripting. So I've reviewed all of this, so let's go ahead and we'll execute those changes. And that, that last button is when this tool actually made changes down to our system. Packaging tool was still capturing in the background, so it caught those changes. In fact, here we can see that it's noticed that our shortcut now points to this thing called PSF Launcher. So that's the kind of behavior we expect to see um, through this process of these two tools working together hand in hand. All right, so we're finishing the monitoring mode here. So um, the tool, uh, the Microsoft tool is, is gathering the types of changes that we made, running a little bit of analysis, figuring out where the not only where the shortcuts are, but other things such as services might appear. So as you get to the 2004 and above operating system, our packages can have services involved in them. This application won't, but will be next on the services report. But had there been a service in there, we would see it here. At this point, we could go into a package editor if we wanted to, but I'm just gonna save this package off. I'm pretty comfortable that what I have will be a good solid package. So after saving it off, it's automatically going to sign the package. That's built in as part of the tool as well. We saw the code signing certificate early on. Okay, so our package has completed successfully. Um, I always look for that word successfully there. The dialogue doesn't look terribly different if something did go wrong. So I always look for that word. Um, and so um, I'll just replace, get rid of my old package that we tried with the converter and replace it with my new package from the packaging tool. 
this sort of shows you the process that you go through now with PSF tooling along with the Microsoft packaging tool as a way to produce those packages. Now, in addition to this method of doing things, um, third-party vendors that do traditional packaging tools also support MSIX. So they have their own way of doing this same type of work. And generally they would include the packet support framework as part of their own software. So you wouldn't use PSF tooling to do that. But this is one of the options that's available to you and it's available for you for free, which is kind of nice. So as we complete a whole bunch of packages, uh, one of the things that many of my customers are concerned about is they work in environments where it's um, a little more dynamic than at other customers. And so if you're deploying MSIX packages using uh, something like Configuration Manager today or even Intune, um, everything we've done so far is really all you're going to need. And you can deploy those packages just as you would any other software that's out there. But if you're in a more dynamic environment, so we're talking about non-persistent VDI or maybe server-based computing, um, those are environments where the amount of time it takes to install an application become really important. You know, that's why we don't use Configuration Manager in those environments. That's why AppV is very, very popular in those environments because we get very fast install times that allow us to be dynamic. So while an MSIX install, um, I measure here against a, a set of typical packages here it being about 19 seconds per application. That's a lot less than it would be for the MSI equivalent, but it's still, if you talk about having, you know, half a dozen to 10 applications that a user has to wait for, if they have to wait for those installs to happen serially one after another, every time they log in, that's just way too much time and that's not going to be acceptable. So that's why we've turned in the past to, to solutions like AppV as a way to quickly and dynamically add those applications in. So in the MSIX world, the equivalent of that is called MSIX AppAttach. Now, it seems like we've been hearing about AppAttach forever because Microsoft announced it when they first acquired FS Logics, and um, it's really been in preview for a very, very long time. But in December, it reached sort of a GA state. I have to say sort of, it's a little bit fuzzy. Parts of MSIX AppAttach are GA, but parts of it, um, you really are still in a preview mode. So you, you got not only the underlying technology, you've got the Azure portal and all this. So hopefully very soon, it'll be completely in GA. Uh, but right now, you know, we have the ability to really effectively go into production with what we have. So I did some testing last summer with those same applications that I was seeing the 18.9 seconds per application for MSIX install time. As I ran through MSIX AppAttach with some very early preview software, I'll point that out, um, I was seeing times here of about 2.6 seconds per app. So it was significantly better. So if you think about someone with, you know, five apps, um, you know, that's 10, 12, maybe 13 seconds um, after the login, all of their apps are ready to go. So that becomes a little more reasonable and supportable. Not quite as fast as AppV, quite frankly, but there are some things that are happening that are gonna improve those times. In fact, if I tested today, I'm sure I'd see slightly better times than that um, as well. So as I talk about MSIX AppAttach though, I really have to talk about it as kind of an overall concept. From a Microsoft perspective, when they say MSIX AppAttach, they're talking about taking these MSIX applications and deploying them through Azure on Windows virtual desktops. And they're very specific with that meaning, but that's not the only place we'll be using AppAttach. So when I talk about AppAttach, I like to break it into the three components. First of all, there is a conversion. So we've already seen one conversion to get into MSIX form, but to really get that fast dynamic performance, we need to convert the MSIX file into a disk image format. And we've got a couple options to play with and I'll be showing those. So once we get it into that format, then we can do a low level implementation. So this actually does things like disk mounting and you know, attaching the thing in, in a, uh, a fashion that is really a little bit more akin to the way app layering solutions work. So we're mounting a disk image and making it available without having to actually copy all of the files of the application down to that system. Now on top of that, there's this high level management function and that's where you go in and you assign applications to users and you automate the whole process so that when they log in, all of their applications just magically show up. And MSIX AppAttach from Microsoft is really a full complete solution that involves all of those pieces built into the Azure portal 
specifically for Windows virtual desktops. Now we'll probably see other vendors implement things that they'll call MSIX App Attach and that'll include the first two components. They'll probably use the same format and format conversions. They'll use the same low-level implementation to bring the package into play at the client machine. But they'll have their own high-level management function on top of that that assigns the applications and the users and sets up the scenarios to get things delivered and running in a just-in-time fashion. So that's what we'll see. I expect they'll probably call it MSIX App Attach as well, although maybe they'll change the term a little bit to try to differentiate. But we expect to see all of the big vendors out there supporting this in the future as well. So I'm going to run a demo here about that first step, though, the image conversion. And we really have a couple of choices in the image conversion. So MSIX App Attach was originally written to use a VHD style container as your disk image to mount. That's the same type of format that most of the app layering products use today. And so they started with that. But as you move to the future, we have this new format that's going to be called SIM. Now, SIM is only available on the 20H2 and above versions of the operating system. So you're going to have to get to those level of operating systems before you can possibly use SIM. But it is a new option, and it may have some good benefits for us not necessarily in terms of direct end user performance, but kind of in scalability. So I'll use a variety of tools here to show you how you can get started with MSIX App Attach today. Even without the Azure portal and Windows Virtual Desktop, you can at least uh, do some testing yourself locally. Now I did talk about the VHD format and SIMFS is new and available to us, so I did want to spend a little time talking about that. Um, these are some numbers I pulled out from the detail portion of the testing of deploying the VHD style uh, package with App Attach. And so um, here you see I broke down about 10% of the time of that 2.6 seconds that I was measuring was this VHD mount operation. And SIMFS will improve that a little bit. I mean, that's not the real purpose of SIM, isn't necessarily to get that time down so much. The other portions there, the package manager and the registration piece, are pieces that uh, I think Microsoft has already attacked a little bit and improved some performance on since I did this testing. But I think they have a lot more room to go. And when we talk about trying to get down to the numbers that, that something like an app V has, uh, that's really where that problem is going to have to be attacked. And quite frankly, as I look at the things that have to happen to integrate an app V package into the system and integrate an MSIX package into the system, um, I really think that MSIX probably has less to do. So they should eventually be able to get down the similar types of numbers that we would see with AppV in its um, non-caching mode uh, style operation. But SIMFS is really about scaling up. So as we take a thousand applications and hundreds and hundreds of users that are all trying to make use of these images up on a package share, um, that's where SIMFS is going to come into play because it's really, I, I refer to it as kind of the modern ISO, right? So VHD, no matter what you want to do, you have to be mounting that for a read-write basis, even though you're never going to write to it. All that file locking and all of those things have to be uh, taken into consideration. But this is a format that's specific for App Attach, and it's really specifically to be a read-only style of attachment so that we can get the kind of scalability that we want in those larger enterprise environments. Okay, so to do the conversion, we do have some different options on how to do it. I'm going to show you a free community tool here first called MSIX Hero. And, you know, in the walking versus running style of thing, this is sort of the first place that I like to start because I can come into a nice GUI-based tool like this. I can ask for MSIX App Attach. Um, the, the MSIX Hero is from uh, uh, Marcin Odaworski. Um, and so um, he's done a nice job with the UI here. So I just come in, I pick my .msix file, um, and then I'll provide some information about you know, how I want the VHD configured. Uh, but he also does a nice thing here in that he will generate some PowerShell script files for you. So in addition to producing the VHD image for us, he's also going to produce some PowerShell scripts that will help us do that low-level registration piece. So that means you don't have to get into a server with management functions, whether it be Azure or a third-party vendor. You can just test this locally on your own systems when you're done. 
Now, the GUI is nice, and that's a good place to start with a single package. Uh, but, uh, of course, I always want to automate things. And so I went looking. I found that there is a tool here from uh, Stefan that uses the MSIX Manager. So MSIX Manager is part of an open source project from Microsoft called Package Manager, so it's a subset of that. But Stefan does have a link here that you can download and get pre-built binaries. And so you'll, you'll get a zip file when you click on that link. Um, you can just throw away the x86 directory. The x64 directory is the, uh, the version that you want because you're gonna be running on a 64-bit machine when you do this. And then, of course, I have another blog post here where I've taken uh, that information and I've turned it into a full-fledged PowerShell script that we can run against all of our MSIX packages to turn them all into either SIM or VHD or as I'll probably do here today, I think I'll probably do both. Okay, so here's a copy of uh, the MSIX package manager that I've dropped down. There's no real install, it's just putting the files down in place. Um, so we've got an EXE and a, and a handful of DLLs that are there. Here's my PowerShell script that you're going to need to go in and, and customize here a little bit because you're going to need to specify where the package manager is, where your MSIX files are, and what type of conversions you want to do and where you want to put them. So those two save locations for SIM and VHD, uh, if I leave them the way it is, will actually generate both, and I'll do that today here for our testing. But if you only wanted one of those two, uh, you would just turn the other one into an empty string is all you'd have to do in that configuration. So then I can run this script. So I'm running against my source being those two MSIX packages we had previously, Avogadro and uh, Siemens JT to pro to go and it'll first do the conversion to the VHC format, and then it'll do the conversion into MSIX format as well. Um, these generally take in the area of 20 to maybe 40 seconds per package, so it's not a significant amount of time to be able to do these things. Uh, but here we can see the output, and of course, just like my other script, it's going to log this output, so you could go review it. Although this process does seem pretty straightforward, I don't really see problems show up in here. I'm sure eventually I'll run into a package that has a problem, uh, but um, it seems pretty uh, benign. It's not really having to understand the package detail all that strongly, uh, more of just the fact that I have these files and I'm gonna put them in this different form. Now, when I do the conversion into a VHD, what I get is a VHD file. So I'll get a disk image, which is a single file, very much like my MSIX package was. Now we could also convert to VHDX, but there really are no benefits to the VS, VHDX format for the way that we use these packages, so I don't bother going to the VHDX format. Now as I convert into the SIM image format, I was actually very surprised early on, and I had to contact Stefan to find out what was happening because I thought I was doing it wrong because the output when we go to SIM is not a single file. There is a file that has a .sim extension that you'll get, but that file is only gonna be about one kilobyte. What you get is a directory of files, and they're not files that match up with the, the files that were in your system. So it isn't quite obvious what's going on there, but it's really that whole directory and the collection of files that we would refer to as being the SIM image. So I'll show you an example of that once we finish off on the packaging. So we can see with the Navigato there at the top of the screen, we can see it took about 28 seconds to, do, uh, to create the, uh, the VHD, about 21 seconds to create the SIM. Uh, the SIM usually is a little bit faster in the creation here, I've noticed. And then um, here we are with the Siemens, it just finished, so we've got 34 seconds and then 46 for the SIM. So it actually took a little longer for the SIM on that second one. So it's a, a, a bit of a toss. I generally find SIM a little bit faster. But that's really you know, what you do with the conversion. So here's my VHD output. So I have a log file, and if I, whoop, sorry, got the wrong window there. Um, I've got the log file, and I've got individual folders that have each of the VHDs in them. So there's the log file. You can see everything was nice and pretty. And then when I look in the file, I'll just have a file there. So if my original package um, was, uh, I think about, uh, that's a, MSIX is a compressed format, very much like AppV. So it was about 100 uh, meg there for the VHD image. Uh, Siemens is probably a better choice because uh, bigger packages were a little closer on this. So we did about 750 megabytes there. And the Siemens package itself, we usually get about a two to one compression in MSIX. So um, that package was probably 
um, about uh, 300, uh, 250 to 300 megabytes originally. So here's the SIM case, and this is where you, know, you can see there's a whole bunch of files in that folder. And the, uh, the one file, which is the uh, top file in that list, is the SIM file. You can see it's one kilobyte. Um, there was one of those region files in there that seems to be like the bulk of our package. Um, and exactly what all of these different files are and the like, I, I really don't understand yet. There's not a ton of documentation out there from Microsoft on SIM. It, it's something they recognize that they need to do. And uh, hopefully we'll get some more information coming forward. But, you know, in addition to MSIX Hero that I showed and, and using the package tool to do this, um, there's a lot of folks who are starting to get involved uh, with this conversion process and MSIX App Attach. And, and, and they're all generating tools um, that work around some of the same principles here to go ahead and generate your packages. Uh, I noticed my uh, namesake, Ryan Mangan, who, who, by the way, is absolutely no relation to me, uh, at least as far as we know. Um, uh, he recently completed some performance testing with SIM, and it seemed to confirm what I was expecting out of SIM to begin with, that you know, it doesn't do a whole lot if you're doing a single user type style of test, it improves a, just a little bit, but it's really more of a scalability feature as we try to run larger environments with this, we're gonna to wanna to be in that SIM format. And of course, by the time you get to that point, um, you'll be on operating systems that can support SIM. So um, uh, that'll be good, because it'll be a few years down the road. Uh, in my blog post, I do talk about um, some peculiarities and all of this uh, that's probably worth reading through if you're gonna go ahead and convert a whole bunch of packages over. So once your packages are over, if you were gonna do this up on Azure with Windows Virtual Desktops, um, you'd have to provide some type of uh, a share location, probably uh, right up there in Azure. You usually want that, um, uh, <clears throat> that, that file system to be relatively close to the application or the virtual machine that's gonna be running it. So putting that up on Azure would make sense, uh, but you would make that available, and then you go into the Azure portal and start assign, uh, importing the applications and then assigning the users to them. All right, so those are the demos that I had for you today in terms of the MSIX and MSIX App Attach, um, kind of where we are in the industry. Uh, I do want to call out this book that we wrote. So this is a free community book uh, that I wrote in conjunction with Bogdan and Kevin. So Bogdan is from Advanced Installer who um, have been great about hosting the infrastructure to deliver this book to you. But it's about a 200 page book that takes the IT pro through everything you need to know about MSIX today. Um, everything from uh, recapture and packaging to uh, all the deployment pieces. Uh, that's why we brought Kevin in. Um, this is a free book. It's about 200 pages. It's an ebook that you can download for free. Um, the guys at Advanced Installer have been great. They don't even require you to register to get the book. You can just go there and download it. Um, I've got the link on here. You can just go to my website and uh, it'll link you over there as well. So before I finish up, I want to bring up one more slide just to kind of give you a heads up as to what I see happening here in the future. So, you know, this is that progress chart we saw here in the last three years. And, and a lot of my efforts this last year have really been focused around the PSF and trying to increase the amount of application compatibility we can get. And so what do I expect when I run these tests again next year? Well, what I expect is I'm not gonna see the same type of gains that we have this year. My focus is gonna shift a little bit for at least for a period of time. We'll see gains, there's no doubt. We need to continue to work on this. But what I think is most important right now is not necessarily to try to get more and more applications into this mix, but to make it easier for you to do the job. So all of the things that we saw us doing here today with the PSF tooling, for example, um, I wanna make that easier for you to do. So it's a little more automatic, uh, a little less uh, um, uh, work for you to be able to achieve the results that we see here. So we'll spend a little bit of time making it easier to do what we can do, and then we'll go back and start to improve the applications that we can do in the future. So that's my story for today. Thanks for joining me here. You can find me at tmergent.com, which is my primary website. You can follow me on Twitter as at Timothy Mangan. Uh, Twitter seems to be the primary way that, that the, both the AppV and MSIX communities communicate, uh, as well as find me up in the Microsoft community portal for MSIX as well, aka.ms slash MSIX will get you there.